Christian church that we are part of in America is in, was in, I'm sorry, the Christian church was in a vulnerable position in AD 70, when the book of Jude was written. All the disciples of Jesus Christ had passed away. Those men that were with Jesus for three years and were trusted to establish the church, by AD 70, all of them had been killed except for John the Apostle, who was far away in the city of Ephesus. Even Paul, the great apostle that traveled around the world, strengthening and establishing the church, had been martyred because of his faith. As those great apostles that were entrusted to establish the church died, a shift occurred in this new, fresh, young Christian church. But it was not a good shift. False teachers began to infiltrate Christian churches and Christian communities. And they got Christians and they took them astray in the doctrine that these false teachers taught and the behavior that these false teachers modeled and encouraged. It's a problem that the man Jude was led by the Holy Spirit to address in this letter that we read this morning that's included in our Bible. And that vulnerable position of the church in AD 70 resembles the vulnerable position that our American church is in today. As churches have transitioned away from preaching about the Bible, preaching through the Bible on Sunday, to giving Christian quote-unquote talks on Sundays, to canceling Sunday school classes because that's too traditional and moving towards a more contemporary ministry. These practices leave our churches susceptible to false teachers and false doctrines that can work their way in, teach people things different than what the Bible teaches, and lead people into behavior that the Bible does not describe. Every year I attend our uh, district's conference in Portland. For the last three years, I've attended there each year with other uh, missionary church pastors and and staff and and ministries. And one guy there uh, does not currently pastor a missionary church. So I'd asked him, you know, you're here. What's your history with the missionary church? And he said, well, I've pastored a couple missionary churches, but the last church I was in, I was there for several years. And there was a group of people that came to our church from another church. They were very kind and friendly at first, but then they started teaching doctrine very different than our church and especially different than me. And he said, next thing I know, I was fired and let go, and those people took over the church. He said, I didn't do anything wrong. There was no sin. I just let these people come in, and they were strong, and I was kind of a more laid-back pastor, and they took over, and they kicked me out. That was his story. He's never pastored another church since then. These type of things happen, and that shows us the relevance of this little book of Jude, That if churches aren't careful, false teachers can sneak in and take over a church. And that's what Jude is trying to prevent here as he writes this letter to the believers in AD 70. So I hope you're there with me in the book of Jude as we go through it. Jude is the last of what we call the general letters or the Catholic letters that are in our Bible from Hebrews up till the book of Revelation. We call that category the general letters. Jude is a unique book. It has no direct Old Testament quotations, but he alludes to the Old Testament nine different times, which seems to indicate to us he was writing to a Jewish audience. He was writing to people that that knew the Old Testament and would be able to pick up on these allusions without him having to, to quote them or explain their significance. But most importantly, Jude is writing to a group of Jewish Christian believers that are being troubled and plagued by false teachers that are sneaking their way into the church. And because of this, as we read Jude, one person described it that I came across this week. Jude is a feisty little book, he called it. Another guy called it a Napoleon book. It is short, but it is powerful. And I hope you will see that as we go through it together. So let's look first at Jude's greeting to believers in verses 1 through 4, starting with that general greeting in verses 1 and 2. Jude says, starts out saying, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God the Father, 
and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Now here we are briefly introduced to the man named Jude that writes this letter. In Greek, his name is Jude Us. In Hebrew, his name is actually Judah, but in English it comes through as Jude. And there are six different Judes that are described in the New Testament, but this Jude is most likely the half-brother of Jesus. He is one of four brothers that Jesus had, one of four half-brothers of Jesus. That's the Jude here that, that was not a believer in Jesus until after Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And Jude tells us the purpose of him writing this letter in verse 3. He says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Now apparently Jude was going to write a letter about a different topic, he tells us here. He references this common salvation he wanted to describe, but apparently the Holy Spirit prompted him or he felt it necessary to instead write about something different. And he writes about the need for these people to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. As I read this, it, it kind of gives the picture in my mind of someone that's driving to their yearly appointment with their doctor, just to have a normal doctor. But as they're on the way to see their physician, they start to pass a kidney stone. We know how painful that is. So instead of going to their doctor, they make a U-turn and they go to the emergency room. Jude had wanted to talk about the you know, common salvation and the good things and what encouragement wouldn't that be to hear about our common salvation, but instead he has to change course and deal with these false teachers. And he references faith here in verse 3 that he's going to come back to and focus on in verse 20. And what he means by faith there is the objective content of faith that we believe in. Now we place our faith, we kind of talk about our personal faith, but this isn't that. This is that objective content of teaching that we believe in that provides us our salvation. And we're going to see Jude as he goes through this letter. That faith, he wants this church to know. He wants them to discern it and to defend it, he's going to describe. And he even mentions that here in verse 3. He says, contend earnestly for that faith that he wants them. It pictures two wrestlers contending for a prize or two armies fighting over the same city. And he describes this purpose in verse 3. He moves on to a warning in verse 4. He says, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, these certain persons, these false teachers, these apostates, he says, are creeping in. It pictures something that kind of sinks or plunges in, or A.T. Robertson in his word pictures of the New Testament, New Testament says it's kind of like someone that sneaks in the side door unnoticed. If you ever go to the hardware store, and you sometimes can buy things that will help you if there is a, a bolt that's on a nut really tight or it's rusted on there and you can't get it off, you can buy something called liquid wrench if you've ever bought something like that. You take a little drop or two and you put it on one side, on the other side, you let it sit overnight and that liquid wrench will slowly seep its way into all the threads and break up and allow that bolt to come free. You wouldn't know the liquid wrench is in there unless you're the one that has put it in there. You'd only need a tiny little drop. And that's the same way with these false teachers. They have crept in unnoticed. And notice the two things they were doing, or the thing they were teaching and the thing they were doing that was causing harm. First, Jude says they have turned the grace of our God into 
licentiousness. Literally, you could translate that. They have turned the grace of God into an unrestrained vice or gross immorality. They're shame, they have a shameless lifestyle and they are flaunting it as a way to supposedly promote the grace of God. The NIV says it great. It says, these people change the grace of God into a license for immorality. They're basically saying sin is good because the more you sin, the more it shows God's grace. And isn't it great to show God's grace? The same reason Paul wrote the book of Romans was to combat that same thinking. So first thing that they're doing that's causing harm is they're using grace as motivation for sin. And the second thing is just below it in verse 4. It says, these certain persons deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. And this is true of almost any cult that we encounter. They will attack the deity of Christ first. J. Vernon McGee says, the acid test of any movement is the teaching regarding the person of Jesus Christ. If that movement denies the deity of Christ, you can rule it out immediately. So that's what these false teachers are doing. They're using grace as motivation for sin, and they're denying that Jesus is master and Lord of their lives. And I think the point that Jude wants them to get in these first four verses is that these aren't some genuine, kind Christians that have just kind of strayed a little bit or struggling a little bit. These are deceptive persons that have an agenda, and they are not believers. And Jude moves on to describe that even more. After this greeting and this purpose and this warning, he spends verses 5 through 16 exposing these false teachers by first giving examples of apostates and false teachers in the past, in the history of Israel. He does that in verses 5 through 7. He says, Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who do not believe, and the angels who do not keep their own domain, but abandon their proper abode, he is kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Jude, Jude makes three references here to Israel when they left Egypt, to angels, and to Sodom and Gomorrah, giving past examples of false teachers and people that have walked away and people that are, that are not followers of Jesus. And he references Egypt here to tell the people he's writing to that when God delivered Israel out of Egypt, not everybody was a believer. There was, in fact, a pretty large group of people that even go God redeemed them and delivered them and miraculously took them out of Egypt, they still didn't believe and follow God. In other words, it's like God saying, Jude, you know, I'm telling you, not everyone gathering with you is a believer. Then he references angels here in verse 6, and he's likely referring to the fall that occurred when Satan rebelled against God and took angels with him. And then after that, in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, there's a story about how angels joined with women and had offspring. And these are the angels that are kept in bonds for a permanent, eternal judgment that he's likely referring to there. And then in verse 7, Jude mentions Sodom and Gomorrah. That's also described in the book of Genesis. See, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah enjoyed immoral, homosexual behavior. They were proud of it. They flaunted it. They refused to repent. And because of that, God judged them and destroyed their city. So those are three past examples of false teachers and apostates that Jude references. Then he gives them some present actions of those apostates, those false teachers in their midst right now. The first set of examples is that they reject authority. 
in verses 8 through 10. Jude writes, Yet in the same way these men, also by dreaming, defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, do not, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand, and the things which they know by instinct. Like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Now as these false teachers reject authority, it says in verse 8 that they use dreams. Maybe they were claiming that they had special revelation from God in dreams, kind of like Joseph Smith has done in the Mormon church. He would get additional, further revelation that the church had to have. Or maybe he's talking about dreams as in these people just live in la-la land. They live in a dream world. Who knows? And then he references Michael here, the angel that disputed with Satan about Moses' body. And then he references in verse 10 how these men, they reject authority. They despise and criticize what they don't understand. And not only do they reject authority, they also walk in error. Verse 11, Jude says, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. And for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are three examples of allegedly religious men that erred. Cain was so spiritually blind he couldn't understand the difference between his offering and Abel's offering in Genesis 4. Balaam was materialistic and deceptive in what he did, and Korah was rebellious and disrespectful to Moses. See, these apostates, these false teachers, they reject error, I'm sorry, they walk in error, they reject authority, but they also lead falsely. We read about in verses 12 and 13. Jude continues, these are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves clouds without water, carried along by the winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead uprooted, Wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam. Wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. Now when Jude mentions the love feasts here, this likely was a, a meal that the local churches would have together among everyone. And then they would have the Lord's Supper after that love feast. And apparently these false teachers had come in among the food and the fellowship and the love feasts. But Jude makes it clear these people lead falsely. He references hidden reefs, which is like stones or rocks that are just under the water in the sea and ships hit them without knowing they're there. He talks about clouds with water that they, clouds without water, you know, they look like they have water, but when they come, they don't yield any rain. He talks about autumn fruit, autumn trees without fruit, right? They look good, but they don't yield anything that we can enjoy. Wild waves of the sea. They might look magnificent and make a lot of noise, but as soon as they hit the shore, they disappear. Or wandering stars. They look beautiful for a moment, but they're gone just as quickly as a shooting star. These descriptions that Jude's giving here for his readers is to tell them that these false teachers, they look good, but they are no good. And lastly, these false teachers, they please themselves in verses 14 through 16. Jude writes, It was also about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoke against them. These are grumblers finding fault, following their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. 
These false teachers, they like the applause of people. They want to tickle people's ears. They desire to be loved. They want a standing ovation. So while Jude makes it clear to expose these false teachers, he also includes in his letter some encouraging words to true believers. Thank goodness, right? And he gives this encouragement to true believers in verses 17 through 23. First, he reminds them of a prediction that these false teachers would come. And then he gives them, gives them some practices of what to do among themselves. First, that prediction that false teachers would come in verses 17 through 19. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. That they were saying to you, in the last time there will be mockers following after their own godly, ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. Now notice that transition at the beginning in verse 17. He says, but you beloved, beloved, He's coming back to the addressees of this letter. He's done talking about the false teachers. Now he's talking about the true Christians and what they're supposed to do in light of what he's already described. And he references the apostles there, which is a, a reference to those men that were disciples of Jesus and then were entrusted to establish the church and write letters and teach, which included the apostle Paul. And he mentions that this was a prediction that those apostles said these false teachers would arrive. Paul, when he was in Ephesus in the book of Acts, said that these false teachers would come. He calls them savage wolves. Paul also referenced these false teachers in his first and his second letter to Timothy. Peter addressed the same letter in two chapters of 2 Peter. And John addressed the same topic in both 1 John and 2 John. All those guys talked about these false teachers that would come. See, sometimes we hear the phrase, doctrine divides. It's kind of like a, a dirty word often sometimes as we talk about doctrine in the church. But what Jude is really describing here is that there should be a point in time where doctrine does divide false teachers from true believers. And not just that, he, he addresses in the last time there for them. In the last time they will show up in verse 18. That describes the period between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. These false teachers will show up in that period. And then Jude continues on and gives practices for these believers once the false teachers arrive. First, he focuses on the practices among themselves, kind of spiritual disciplines for their personal lives. And then he focuses on practices to direct towards others, more of a pastoral activities towards others. In verses 20 through 23, he says, but you beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting, save others snatching them out of the fire, and on some have mercy without fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Now if you have the sermon handout there. I have more notes on there than normal because we're covering more verses today. That way you can kind of follow with me a little easier, I hope. And as Jude gives these practices among true believers, once the false teachers arrive, those practices that they're supposed to do are first among themselves in verses 20 and 21. And at the beginning of verse 21 is the imperative, really what he tells them to do, kind of the heading. He says, keep yourselves and the love of God. That's the main thing they're supposed to do. And then Jude gives three participles that show up, at least in my translation. So they keep themselves in the love of God by the means of building, 
yourselves up on the most holy faith, two, praying in the Holy Spirit, and three, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he references building there in verse 20. They're supposed to build themselves up in the faith, and that's the same faith described in verse 3, that object content of our faith, the faith that we place our belief into. It's that body of truth that God's word gives us about Jesus and who he was and what we believe in. And what he's telling them is to be building themselves up in that faith, to be growing and improving in their understanding of God's word. See, a true Christian is not a static Christian, according to Jude. We should be growing. Our son is going to be starting a kindergarten in September. And after he graduates kindergarten, if, if he was to say, I did my school, I'm done, right? Most of us would say, no, it's not going to quite cut it to be a productive, tax-paying citizen of our country, right? But sometimes when it comes to people placing their faith in God, it has the idea, well, I, I placed my faith in Jesus. I got dunked in water. I went through the membership class. I'm done. And they kind of stop there. But when we build our faith, we're supposed to be studying God's word. We're supposed to be growing. We learn what God says in his word and we act on it. This requires we study scripture, not just to go in there and look for a couple of encouraging nuggets for us, but to really dig into it or to read obscure parts of the Bible to see what we can learn, like Jude or Obadiah, <laughs> these books we've been in that some of us don't spend a lot of time in. That's how we grow in our faith. Warren Wiersbe says, I have yet to meet a strong, fruitful Christian who ignores the Bible. And that's true. That's why we need to read God's word every day. Listen to sermons on podcasts or the radio. Read Christian books. Or if we don't like to read, you know, let our phone read the Bible to us and we can listen to it while we clean the kitchen or cook or, or do chores. But building that faith is only one way that they're supposed to practice among themselves. They're also supposed to be praying in the Holy Spirit there in verse 20. See, this is a call for them and for us to be praying according to the will and the desire of the Holy Spirit. Tony Evans says, pray with a spiritual mindset in concert with God's desires and God's design based on God's will. When we pray in the Holy Spirit, we don't come to God with a grocery list of gimme, gimme, gimme's. We pray, God, this is, you know, I want to do your will and follow your will. 1 John chapter 5 tells us about praying. John says, this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which have been asked of him. In other words, we pray under the direction and help of the Holy Spirit. But also Jude tells them here in verse 21, to be waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. This describes our eager and hopeful anticipation of Jesus returning and coming back. Sometimes it's hard with our eyes in front of us. We see all the discouragement, but it's helpful to have reminders to, to look up for encouragement from God. N.T. Wright, who was the Bishop of Canterbury, was his title. Fancy title for he was leader of the Anglican Church but that was his role for many years, wrote this about these work verses. He said, all Christian discipleship has this forward look, referencing here to verse 21. As we see moral and religious disarray all around us, we long and pray for that mercy for ourselves and for the church, which will come at the last and please God will also come in a measure in times of healing and renewal in advance of the day that is coming, he says. We wait with hope and positive expectation. And Paul wrote about that hope in Titus 2.13. 
He told them, you all should be looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great Savior, Jesus Christ, he told them. So those are the practices that we do among ourselves. To keep ourselves in the love of God, we're supposed to be building ourselves up in our faith, praying and waiting. But also, Jude gives them some things to do among others. In verses 22 and 23, he tells them to have mercy on the people that are doubting in verse 22. And have mercy on some who are doubting. See, apparently these false teachers were troubling even Christians and putting doubts in their minds and troubling them and causing troubles to them. But Jude tells these people, don't slander those people, don't discourage them, be there for them, encourage them and walk with them. Answer their questions. He also says to save the lost. He says, save others, snatching them out of the fire. Apparently, there were some people that were never believers, and it was the job of these people to go get them. And lastly, Jude gives them some warning. On some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. In other words, don't let that sin contaminate you as you go in there to try to get these people. Stand guard, stand strong, and be careful. And as Jude wraps this up, he gives a goodbye benediction, verses 24 and 25. Probably the most famous two verses of this little book we've all heard. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever. Amen. Here Jude is describing for these believers the assurance that they have because of their faith that is in God, right? Their security that they have should lead them to praise God. As we end our time together, I was reviewing the sermon notes last night, as I normally do for about an hour and a half. I don't do parties or birthdays or anything on Saturday nights. I usually go through my notes, and I told my wife, I said, I want to preach Jude again, but I want to do it over four weeks, not one Sunday, because it's a powerful little book. There's a lot in there. There's a lot that I skipped right over. You probably have questions about that should be explained. But with only one Sunday, we have to summarize the big idea of this book. And that big idea would be this, that Jude condemns apostates and he encourages believers to contend for their faith. See, doctrine does divide. And Jude would say that when you encounter false teachers, when you encounter apostates that say, Grace gives us a reason to sin more. When you encounter people that say Jesus was not God, Jude would say doctrine divides, and that is good. God, thank you for this book that reminds us it's okay to to know what we believe, to stand up for what we believe, and to be weary of people that might come to us kindly at first, but but want to have an agenda for our church and take us in a direction we don't want to go. Thank you for that gentle reminder for us that it's okay for us to stand up for what we believe. It's okay to, to tell others that we disagree because of our doctrine, because that's what your word says here with Jude. I pray for our church that you would strengthen us and help us to stand strong when when we encounter difficulties like this, or maybe if we know of neighboring churches in our, in our city and our friends that are encountering these same trials, I pray that you would use us and minister through us so we can help other churches that might face these similar issues. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll invite you to stand for the benediction. Thanks for joining us today as we worship our Lord and enjoy our first first Sunday of summer.
Let us go and worship you, Lord, in what we say, in what we do, in what we think. Please let us saturate our city and our community with our worship of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Dismissed.